Aloha and Happy New Year. I'm Mark Schlaub, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today is my first program of 2021, and we're going across the sea to New York to talk with my friend Audrey Kitagawa. Audrey is the president of the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family. However, Audrey was originally a lawyer. She began to practice law in Hawaii about the same time as me. And she and I shared similar thoughts about bringing together the international legal community. In 1985, Audrey and I were part of the team that organized the first Hawaii Japan Lawyers Conference in Hiroshima, Japan. In 1996, Audrey left Hawaii and the law. And I've asked her to share her journey and message with us today. Aloha, Audrey. It's, it's, Aloha, it's, and thank you so much, Mark, for having me on this program. It's wonderful to see you after all these years, <laughs> and I wish to uh, give my welcome to this program and my uh, great fondness and aloha to all of my colleagues. Uh, who I have not seen in years. And of course, it's wonderful to see you and to mention our convening in Hiroshima, which is a sister city to Honolulu and the wonderful time that we had there with the uh, Hiroshima Hawaii State Bar Association program that you so fabulously put together. It was an exquisite program. And uh, I remember our colleagues who went with us and the colleagues that we met in Hiroshima. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal program. So thank you, Mark, because you really were instrumental in keeping that program uh, alive and well and being so productive. And that was when you were a lawyer and, and you, you, you actually were born and raised in Hawaii and uh, went into the practice of law from 1977 to 1996 and with an excellent firm. Uh, and doing a good job as a lawyer. And I, first, I want to start there. I want to ask you, why did you become a lawyer? And how did you feel about practicing law and being a lawyer in Hawaii? Let, let, let's start with that. And we'll go on to what happened. Well, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a lawyer. Initially, I thought I would go into the medical profession, but I had to be realistic. And math and chemistry were not my strong subjects. <laughs> So I decided that I would help to enact laws that would be beneficial to society. You know, I was very idealistic. And uh, back then my father ran for the House of Representatives when I was a freshman in college. So I actually took a semester off from college and um, helped with his campaign. I was actually his campaign manager with absolutely no experience. He ran on the Republican ticket. And I decided really that uh, my route to politics was not to my liking, but I still wanted to be a lawyer. So I pursued that profession and pretty much kept out of the political arena, though many people thought that I should be involved in politics. Uh, at the same time that my father ran for office, Tom Rice, who was a state Repub Republican party chairman um, at that time as well. <clears throat> so I got to know him because of his uh, responsibility mm -hmm. to help candidates on the Republican ticket. And besides helping my father, I was approached by the King Kiyosaki campaign to help with their youth component of their governor, lieutenant governor's campaign. And initially I was approached by Ralph Kiyosaki, who was at the time that I was the student representative on the board of education. Uh, he was the state superintendent of schools. And, um, you know, he was quite a visionary and a great gentleman. And uh, he approached me to help on his campaign. And of course, everyone in Hawaii knows that Sam King was a federal judge whose father was the first governor of the then territory of Hawaii. And so they be, ran on the governor, lieutenant governor's ticket, the King Kiyosaki Republican ticket. And all of the Republican candidates lost that year. But I learned many things about politics. And of course, uh, you know Ralph Kiyosaki very well. I believe he is uh, uncle to your wife and uh, such a phenomenal man. And all of the, and of course, Judge King too was quite 
a remarkable individual. And uh, I was approached to work for the Republican Party after the elections were over. But Tom Rice told me that I should complete my education first and make that a priority and return to the political world once I receive my education, if it still appealed to me. He liked the way I worked and gave me a job every summer with his law firm because I told him I wanted to be a lawyer. And he hired me until I graduated from law school. And then I went to work for his law firm um, after I graduated from law school. You know, Tom was a consummate professional and a very great man. And I didn't realize at the time how really busy he was being the lead partner in a law firm, Rice Lee and Wong, and tending to being the chair of the Republican Party during the term of the elections. And I was always grateful to him to offer me a job during my summers and then hiring me upon graduation from law school. So, you know, I have many fond memories of uh, that time in my life and the steep learning curve uh, in being engaged in political processes in local government. Well, you, you know, you, and, and you, you were with a, and he was a great guy. Tom, Tom Rice, great guy, good, good law firm. I remember it very well. Uh, and you were a standout attorney there and you were there for 20 years. Then you left. Boy, well, actually, um, I was with his law firm not all that long. Okay. I launched my own office uh, in the Hasegawa Komuten building after oh, I true. departed Rice Lee and Wong. And I actually was offered a position with David Shutter's office. Oh. And uh, of course, everyone knows that David Shutter was a very prominent uh, attorney in Hawaii. And then I, <clears throat> I changed my mind after letting everybody know at Rice Lee and Wong that I was going to work for Dave Shutter. And then I changed my mind and decided to go out on my own. <laughs> so I've learned a little bit about you that I didn't know, okay. Okay. <laughs> so in any event, uh, I had my own law office. I did practice law for about 20 years and I was very happy being a lawyer as that was the career path that I chose. And I really liked the discipline of practicing law. You know, I had a routine of getting up early in the morning to meditate, then head off to do my workout at the Honolulu Club, which used to open in those days at 4.30 in the morning. I don't know if it still does, but you know, there was a small group of type A personalities who stood by the elevator promptly at 4.30 waiting for it to open. <laughs> and yeah, I would, do my workout and head off to the office to start my day. But often my spiritual mother would call me to come and meditate with her before I went to work. And, you know, so those 20 years of practice uh, really were uh, the practice of discipline, hard work. And of course, I really enjoyed my career and my, my law practice. Okay, so by the way, the Honolulu Club is, is closed. Uh, because of the pandemic, uh, as I understand it. And uh, so that has changed. Uh, now, let's, let's go back. And I think we have a hint of, of maybe what, what happened. But after 20 years, why did you leave the practice of, in, in Hawaii? What, what motivated you to make that life change? Well, that is a very long and involved story. But suffice to say, that I was chosen to lead a spiritual community that arose from uh, you know, those who came to listen to the beautiful, pure stream of what I would call sacred transmissions that emanated from my spiritual mother, who was my predecessor, and we all called her Divine Mother. And she gave the most exalted spiritual messages that one could have the privilege to hear. And many people came from all walks of life to hear her words of wisdom. You know, there was a great peace that one felt being with her. And she had this incredible, um, you know, it's like as if you were the only person there and she had a laser focus on you and understood you. And there was just this uh, union uh, with her 
that uh, just filled you with a lot of love. And her words of wisdom moved us from this self-centered kind of preoccupation of the little me to the bigger world of being coming thoughtful and mindful of others. And I'll give you an example. Before I met her, I was chronically tardy. I mean, I was always late. And in fact, some of my friends used to give me a different time, way in advance of the actual time of the event, knowing that by the time I showed up, I would be on time if they gave me an advanced, you know, time of the event. And um, being with my spiritual mother, I got to see how she was always so mindful of others. And she never wanted to waste people's time. They didn't want to keep people waiting. So just through the process of observing her behavior, I became a very prompt person because she was meticulous in her mindfulness of others and never uh, imposing on wasting people's time or, you know, she was just so thoughtful in every way. And just through the observation, because it's not something she ever lectured me on or ever scolded me about, but just by observing how she behaved, I became a very prompt person because promptness was uh, important to her because of her practice of being mindful of others. And when you consider that time really are units of our life and how we spend our life, it is very important that we become mindful of not imposing our time frame on other people's you know, life and cause them to be unhappy waiting. And, you know, so I got to see that in this tardiness, this slovenliness, I should say, um, that was, you know, quite extreme, that I was being very thoughtless of others. And so I really got shaped up just by being with her. So in that fashion of how she lived her life, and the example that she set, I, I got straightened out in many ways. And the whole purpose is really to have consideration of others, a greater mindfulness of others. And in that whole process, the development of the heart to really care for others and to see how our conduct uh, impresses upon the lives of other people and that we should do our best to bring uh, the benefits of your presence in other people's lives rather than all of the um, grief, heartache, and negativity. So we do have a choice in how we live our lives. So, you know, at the time, uh, I learned so many things from her. And, you know, the motivation to make uh, the change in my life came about when uh, actually uh, she had chosen me to take over for her uh, as the head of the spiritual community that had grown around her because so many people wanted to hear her beautiful transmissions that were quite extraordinary. I mean, she spoke in a spiritual language that was not common language. And it was very uplifting and elevating and quite remarkable. So when I first met her, I had graduated from college. I was on my way to law school. She was the last person in Hawaii who I was going to meet. A friend of mine said, Audrey, I know you are a sincere seeker after God, and you really must meet this lady. And in fact, she changed my life. So um, I had an appointment to see her, knocked on the door, and she opened the door, she took one look at me and she pointed at me and she said, you cannot serve two masters. And somehow in my heart, I knew exactly what she meant. Not that I could articulate uh, you know, what it was that I understood at that time, but I just knew what she was telling me was true. So um, her having said that, uh, you know, I felt that the day would come when I would have to choose mm. between the career that I chose and to do what I had chosen to do 
um, as opposed to what she ultimately would ask me to do, and which I promised to uh, undertake what she asked me to do. <clears throat> and that was to fulfill a mission. And I gave my word to her that I would do so before she left her body. So she actually gave me a special, shall we say, power of attorney uh, to undertake this, um, what I call a sacred mission. And so the day did come when I would have to give up my law career. But I also understood in my first year of law school that the, this day would come because I had a very interesting experience in my first year of law school um, that indicated to me that I would actually give up my legal career to undertake my spiritual uh, mission. And that while I was not told specifically the date or the year when I would have to do that, I was left with the knowing that I would be crystal clear that uh, the day had arrived and that I would have to close my law practice. And it turned out exactly like that. And that once that day came, I would have to live by uh, divine providence and will alone. And I was meant to go wherever it was the divine will to take me to go. So it was a very kind of um, deeply intuitive way of living uh, to not be attached or fixed to any of my attachments and to be able to, you know, leave um, Hawaii, leave my career. And because, you know, if I was extremely attached, which I was, I mean, I love my career, uh, then it would be very difficult to give it up. So the day came, I closed my law office very quickly. And uh, then I proceeded on to the next step, which brought yeah, me to I, New York City. I, I don't think many of us who are your friends and law colleagues, where, where, where did she go? What, <laughs> what did, where is she, what's she doing? Well, 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 okay, where did you go? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as you know, I didn't say goodbye to anybody. I made no announcements. I did select um, an attorney, Tim Luria, actually, to take over whatever cases I had and my staff, and he agreed to do that at the same benefits. And uh, then I uh, quickly closed my law office. It was so fast, I, I didn't even have a chance to tell my, my family. I intended to tell my family that weekend, but in the meantime, my mother found out when she tried to reach me at the office and my phones were all disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> so I left so quickly and it was, you know, I didn't want to have to do any explaining because I didn't want anybody to say what my mother uh, said to me, which was after our phone call, initial phone call, you know, inquiring how come my phone was disconnected. And I explained to her that I closed my law office. And I actually intended to see her that weekend to do the explanation, because after all, she worked very hard to send me to uh, college and law school. And uh, she listened. And, you know, then we hung up. And I thought, wow, you know, that wasn't uh, so difficult. Until the next morning, she called me early in the morning and she said, have you lost your mind? <laughs> she said, I couldn't sleep all night long. What have you done? And I guess uh, because, you know, um, I was so committed to the practice of law and my career, um, you know, it was like incredulous that I would actually give it up. So I went uh, from Hawaii to uh, New York City after I closed my practice to help with the State of the World Forum, which is an organization founded by Mikhail Gorbachev. And it was doing an international conference. Uh, you know, it has been doing international conferences in San Francisco, uh, but since they wanted to have a conference for the first time outside of San Francisco in New York City to align with the opening of the UN General Assembly for the Millennium Gathering of the Heads of State, I offered to go to New York City to help them prepare for this international conference. 
And, you know, I help with uh, coordinating the outreach meetings, the morning meditations with spiritual religious leaders, because it was about a week long conference and having members of my spiritual community also help out by manning a call center, which is located in a law firm to do the outreach. And I also attended a lot of meetings with the head of the uh, forum, and we met many interesting people as part of this outreach to have uh, keynote speakers present at this conference. And um, we did have Mikhail Gorbachev attend, and President Wahid of Indonesia, President Obasanjo of Nigeria, several department heads of the UN, and many other uh, eminent persons uh, presented at the conference. And through that outreach, I met Olara Atunu, who was a special representative of the UN Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict. And he brought me into the UN to help in his office as an advisor. And initially, my plan was to stay in New York City for only six months to help with this uh, State of the World co uh, Conference and then return to Honolulu. But since I found myself in the UN immediately after the conference, I um, continue to stay in New York City. So this year will make my 21st year here in New York City. Uh, but, you know, of course, I still retain my homes in Honolulu and my families in Honolulu. And I always made it a point to return to Honolulu uh, you know, for the holidays especially, and uh, to be with my mother um, and host the family gatherings for the holidays once she turned 90 years old. She passed away at age 99, mm -hmm. and she always said hard work never killed anybody. She was a very hardworking lady, and since she lived to be 99, I take her at her word. <laughs> and well, but, you know, she was just wonderful. You know, you so you you were given uh, a relationship with a spiritual person who kind of directed you on, and, and gave and gave you some idea of, of where you to go, and that you you kind of took that journey. And now, where are you now? I mean, what you're you're the head of the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family. And they, the, the people there call you Divine Mother. What, what do you do? What does that mean? What are your present plans and where are you going? And we have about five minutes left. So tell us. Where, five where, minutes where, already. Yeah. <laughs> wow, time really flies. Unbelievable. Well, you know, the spiritual community, as I share, you know, sprang up around uh, Divine Mother. And so when she passed on and chose me to head the spiritual community, then you know that uh, the designation was passed on to me as well and i've traveled to over 50 countries uh, several countries many times over and had the privilege to meet some of the world's most fascinating people and continue to meet and work with amazing people and i do continue to lead the spiritual community and i just concluded in fact uh, on saturday six international broadcasts with my spiritual community for the holidays, which I've been doing for, you know, uh, years now during the holidays. And, um, you know, the, so the Light of Awareness International Spiritual Family is a name that I gave the community that sprang up around my spiritual mother. And uh, so, you know, I've been uh, continuing to travel speak about the uh, you know sacred messages that she gave to us and to work with the spiritual family to be able to uh, develop their inner life, their spiritual lives, and to see how in the context of being householders, we can have the actualization of the reality of the divine in our daily lives. Because she always said where we are is our holy ground and we must be able to find God here now. So, so I mean, it, and and you know, the, here, here, here's so. What is your message to the folks out there? And I also want to ask you, in this time uh, in our society, what are is, is there hope for us? Where where are we going? Where, what are your thoughts? Well, of course, there's hope because our capacity to change 
that we can become better people, better custodians of our environment, and that we can learn and grow and utilize that intelligence and good hearts and wills and intentions that we can all participate in helping to make this world a better place. So our capacity to actually change, to be flexible, to adapt to all of life's challenges is very hopeful because that aspect that was given to us as part and parcel of the sacredness of our lives is inherent within us. And it is always my hope that the beauty and fullness of everyone's potential will be realized in this lifetime. And all of the challenges that we fail, face become modalities by which we can practice and to see how we can be participants in creating positive solutions for change and to make this world a better place. And we all have responsibility as global citizens to one, work on our own inner development and character, and then to be able to translate it in action in our daily lives through loving thoughts, loving speech, and loving actions, so that collectively, as we all represent how we are living our individual lives, the footprints that we leave behind will become a legacy of inspiring beacons of light and inspiration to all those whose lives we touch. And so you're, and you're saying that, I, what I hear you saying is that all people have that potential. All Absolutely. people have that potential and that ability. They just have to recognize it. Is that, is that recognize it and then, and then act on it? Is that, is that, am I hearing that right? Yes, uh, it requires awareness. And so therefore, you know, the name of our um, community, mm -hmm. the light uh, yeah. of awareness, means okay. that this aspect of awareness will allow us to make those necessary changes. Because in this lifetime, where we are is the holy ground. And we have to be able to find God here and now. And she always said that God is love. So the actualization of the re living reality of God in the seemingly ordinariness of daily life, through every loving thought, word, and deed, is made alive and a living reality in our presence daily. And you know, if you've ever read Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town, which won the Pulitzer Prize, it poses a stark reminder to us that when we get so busy with the tasks of living, that we do not fully appreciate the beauty of life itself. And the moments of great beauty and love that exists are out of the awareness because of our ignorance in the getting so busy that we forget that life, though while it is full of challenges, is also filled with great beauty. And it is our responsibility to work on ourselves that we may become better people through the development of a heart of love, compassion, and kindness for ourselves and each other. So collectively, we then represent the community of human beings and all sentient beings to live life on the high road, always giving hope and inspiration to all those whose lives we touch. Well, Audrey, uh, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your message. And I, I, I've learned a lot just, just from hearing you talk and and, and learning more about what happened, wh where you went, and what you've become, and what your thoughts are. So thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to see you again, and uh, hopefully uh, you'll get back to Hawaii sometime. Yes, I will, as soon as COVID lockdown is over, and I'll be sure to touch base with you when I land. And thank you so much for having me on your program. And to all of my colleagues and friends in the legal profession, you know, it's, it's very joyous to make this connection through this broadcast. And I hope that we will be able to renew our friendship as the years go by and we not lose touch with each other. Okay, aloha, aloha. Aloha, thank you so much, Mark. Infinite blessings to you and happy new year. Thank you, same to you. Aloha. Thank you.